Um, a kid from uh, actually from around here in North Jersey. We're here in New Brunswick today, the State Theater, doing a Blondie gig, and. Uh, talking about the early days of, uh, I guess, my rock and roll experiences. Um, you know, the Beatles, for people of my generation, were the catalyst, really, for our ambition to become a rock star or a pop star or a musician, but something more than a musician, something that kind of transcended just complete, complete just being a musician and kind of larger than life type of figure. For me, it was people like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and... Uh, you know, the Kinks, the Yardbirds, the Who, they were like all sort of like these huge inflatable dolls, you know, they like, if they would have walked into a room, they would have seemed 50 feet tall. And, uh, you know, my early record collection was mostly British Invasion, Stones, Beatles, like I said, Kinks, Who, and then I like bubblegum music a lot, I like the 1910 Fruit Gum Company, I like Herman's Hermits, I like the Ohio Express, and, uh, you know, you can hear elements of that in uh, the, the early Blondie sound. Uh, we were almost like a bubblegum band in a lot of ways. I like the Bay City Rollers for the, the energy that they had. Well, and pretty much from my early teens, I was always in rock and roll bands. It was kind of like my, uh, my social scene. Uh, from first, first year of high school, I had a band for a couple of years. And then the last two years of high school, I had another band. We'd always been like Battle of the Bands or playing at... CYO centers or at Jewish community centers and you know that was kind of like uh, my weekend consisted of going out and, and gigging and uh, you know I had this band uh, called uh, Total Environment funny enough it was like sort of a light show bit and all that and uh, there was a thing Cousin Brucey's Big Break Cousin Bruce Morrow was a DJ on WABC AM in New York and uh, my band sent in a tape and we actually got chosen to be in the finals, and, and coincidentally that year, the finals took place at Carnegie Hall. So I was like 14 years old playing at Carnegie Hall. So uh, it was kind of like the reverse thing. I almost started at the top in a way, you know. So that really kind of gave me a sort of a, a really big inspiration to um, continue and try to make it in uh, show business. And, uh, our first recording session was at AB WABC Studios on... Uh, I think 55th and 6th Avenue, something like that. And, uh, coincidentally, years later, I was up at the same studio doing an interview with the band, and I was reminiscing about the fact that I had been in that studio back when, when I was 13, 14 years old, and lo and behold, the, the engineer that was, in, that was engineering the interview came out and said, you know what, I was the engineer on that session at that band, and by the way, here's a tape of it. So that was like pretty crazy. So I have the tape from when we recorded back in... Uh, you know, it was like, I guess, the late 60s. Yeah. You know, early record collection, like I said, was all those kind of stuff from the 60s. Top 40 radio, of course, at the time, played everything from James Brown to the Four Seasons to the Rolling Stones to Frank Sinatra. So you had a really eclectic mix of music that you were kind of assimilating into your sort of psyche at the time, you know, when you were a kid in the 60s and the early 70s. And you know... A little bit later on, the New York Dolls and Roxine Magazine, you know, like that was like the Bible. And of course, the Dolls were always featured prominently in Roxine Magazine. And, you know, when I moved into Manhattan in my, my late teen years, if I would see someone like Sylvan Sylvain of the Dolls or, or Johnny Thunders or Johansson, any of them on the street, it was like incredible. Once again, these larger than life figures uh, that basically were like this fantasy, you know, these fantasy human beings. They were like, uh, you know, just some kind of creation and uh, of course uh, it was all portrayed uh, through in Roxine magazine which was kind of like almost like a local rag for people that lived on the east coast or people that lived in New York mm -hmm. uh, Richard Robinson Lisa Robinson and of course Bob Gruen was doing a lot of sh a lot of shots then I remember the first time we were in Roxine with Blondie it was it was definitely a pivotal uh, moment it was exciting you know to, to be to be shown in that magazine and it was that sort of culture that existed around uh, rock and roll at the time that I think has probably gone away a bit now. Um, you know, I mean, there's Jack White or sort of Noel Gallagher or people like that, but there aren't really that many true sort of rock and roll stars. I mean, people always ask me who I would like to play with. And, you know, I have, you know I've worked with various people over the years, you know, thanks to being in Blondie, I've met a lot of people. I recorded with Townsend, with Bob Dylan, 
uh, you know, Eurythmics, I always played with the Ramones, but if I had my druthers, I would really love to play with Little Richard or Chuck Berry, who are the really true rock and roll stars. You know, they're kind of the epitome of what it meant to be a rock and roll musician, and, and both of those guys are still around, and uh, I'd love to work with them sometime. Um, and then, uh, you know, I had a band called Sweet Revenge, and we were playing Club 82 in New York around the same time that... Uh, the Dolls were in Wayne County, and the, Debbie and Chris had a band called the Stilettos. That's when I first hooked up with them. And, uh, you know, the Club 82 is a neglected uh, piece of rock and roll history, really. Everyone talks about CBGB all the time. Club 82 was 82 East 4th Street, which coincidentally was right around the corner from CBGB. And uh, there was a band called the Neon Boys used to play there with Verlaine and Richard Hell. And like I said, the Dolls would always play there. And that was kind of like my uh, spawning ground, my introduction into the sort of New York City rock and roll uh, debauchery and uh, hierarchy. Uh, you know, then actually seeing Johnny Thunders uh, laying on the stairs, passed out with Sable Star and things like that. So it was kind of great. Then I'd pick up Rock Scene magazine and see photos of sort of the night before. And, you know, it was all kind of, the dots kind of all got connected through Rock Scene magazine. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean... We were featured in there a bunch of times after that. You know, they were always pretty supportive of the band and the whole New York scene in general. And, <clears throat> you know, the energy that was created at CBGB, Max's Kansas City, uh, contributed to the success of bands like the Ramones or Patti Smith or Blondie. I, I think there was a synergy that was happening. There were certain magazines that the bands were featured in. And without the sort of uh, cumulative effort of all the bands, I don't think Blondie, as we know it today, would still be here. I think, you know, there was a big push from all the energy, the syntax that was happening on the New York scene. It was really our Cavern Club, CBGB, and, you know, Max's Kansas City and all that stuff. So, and, you know, rock scene portrayed all that and it's come to life, kind of, so uh, it was always fun. That's cool.